Hello, everyone, and we're glad you can attend Attitude's weekly ADHD Experts webinar. We do hope that everyone is staying safe and staying well. Just some housekeeping before we get started. If you've listened to one of our webinars before, you know we offer attendees a certificate of attendance. When the webinar ends, a post-event survey will pop up. It will list three questions about the quality of the webinar, followed by three questions titled Required for Certificate. If you would like a certificate of attendance emailed to you, you should answer those three questions. If you don't, well, don't bother answering them. Uh, as parents working at home and teens learning at home these days, many challenges arise as schedules collide, distractions abound, and motivation and organization are hard to come by. So we decided to ask parents about their biggest obstacles to getting work done and keeping their kids on track with their schoolwork. We have captured your concerns and issues on the slides that follow. We asked Jody Sleeper Triplett to address them. She is a trainer, mentor, coach, and speaker, and author of Empowering Youth with ADHD. She is contributing author of Becoming Self-Determined, Creating Thoughtful Learners in a Standards-Driven Admissions Frenzied Culture. Her company, JST Coaching and Training, provides student and ADHD coach training programs to individuals and educational institutions. You can ask questions of, Do of Jody as she addresses your concerns, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. If for some reason you want to download the slides of the webinar, click the drop-down menu labeled Event Resources on the bottom left of your screen. If you do not see the Event Resources tab, you need to refresh the page. So thanks for being here today, Jody, and help to get us through these difficult times. My pleasure. I'm glad I can help, or I hope I can help. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for being here, for taking a, maybe a short break for yourself um, in the midst of all the chaos of being at home. One of the, the points that I made to, um, to Wayne before we started was this is like being in a space station that you and your families are in a, in a space station where you have limited resources and it's necessary to come up with new ways to manage. Um, completely big, different, it's a transition, and this transition is affecting everybody in the household. So I just want you to keep that in mind that whether it's an individual with ADHD and executive functioning problems or someone else in the family, um, the stress is there for all of us. So the first challenge that was brought up to me is about no motivation. When we have an issue with no motivation for students, one of the problems that I find helps, to, to, one of the things that helps that, and I'm just going to check for one second, there's a barking in the background. Um, so yes, it's my dogs. Let, let me attend to them. Okay. Great. So uh, it's like there's music barking, and then see, it's just like being in your house right now, everyone. And then I'm not trying to make total light of it, but uh, definitely is distraction. So when you think about no motivation, part of that really comes down to instead of no motivation, think about how small a chunk can you help your child break their work into. By chunking down, by setting up frequent breaks, reasonable breaks short breaks, accountability check-ins that you work on with your child and maybe even find out, well, is there someone that you could study with online? If they're trying to do work independently and it's not a live class, there's a, there's a huge benefit in having someone else to go over the work with. You can still monitor that, but definitely help them to figure out who they can connect to other than you as a parent, because that in and of itself makes it makes more pressure for your teenagers. Next slide. So being overwhelmed by work. When I think about this, it's sometimes parents, as well-meaning as we are, we're not the best resource for our, our kids, for our teenagers. So 
part of it is figuring out, well, who else could be a resource? Um, finding a, again, whether that's a study buddy, I'm certainly not promoting coaches from a, from a financial side. This is just a suggestion. There are coaches out there during this time that are willing to work with families at reduced rates because we know that you need help. So being able to help your kids not shut down, um, be more motivated, it helps them to have a focus so that they're not feeling the struggle. If they know what's next, it's like going down the stairs and being able to see the steps in front of you. When you know what those are, even if it's a long flight, you can get to the bottom. So I just recommend that you look outside yourselves virtually to find a way to help your kids get um, a little more relaxed around doing work and chunking it into small pieces. Next slide. When there's no physical outlet, my response to that is there is. There's, there's definitely something for energy. Um, one of the suggestions is to use the space, not only in your house, but if you have a yard and, and there's a way to get out there, set something up for the family. If your, um, your teens and younger kids, if they're at this stage of life where they're willing to do something with you, Start early morning, do it in the afternoon. Just find a way to get outside. And if you're indoors, um, play music. Find something that everyone can get involved in. Uh, it could be music while you wash the windows or um, taking breaks and having something that's a little bit different. Also, Working, doing schoolwork while standing up, if you can raise up the computer or put it on top of like a chest of drawers so that um, your kids don't have to sit all the time. I know that I go back and forth um, with a standing desk and a sitting desk because of the fact that it's better for my back. So having something that allows you to move and get up and down on a regular basis will help jumping jacks, anything that can be done but encourage your kids to think of it as just different exercise rather than no exercise. Next slide. Lost without a consistent daily routine. This is a big one. It, it impacts the executive functioning. It really, it's, it's like shaking everything upside down. And so being able to shift it um, could be solved by working with your teenagers and saying, okay, rather than telling you what I want you to do, let's sit down together and talk about what are you willing to do and what's the schedule that might mirror what you did at school and how can we work on that together? Um, so the inability to get out of bed, um, sleeping too much, missing assignments. When you set up a routine and there's an understanding of all the steps, and you work on having accountability check-ins. I do it a lot with text messages, uh, maybe on the hour, just something that allows that check-in. And often the check-in is just enough for your teenager to say, oh, that's right, I'm supposed to be doing this, and I'm, I need to get up. The waking and sleeping part, my hope for a lot of people, because this is such a, with such a quick and dramatic shift in our lives, that's going to come over time. So to go from everything to nothing, as you mentioned in the physical outlet issue with no um, exercise, as we shift our routines and transition, it's just taking a little longer for your teenagers to transition to their bodies and their brains. So I encourage you to really make a plan with them, get their input, because giving choice and having input from your teenager is definitely going to help them buy into what they need to do. And I'll be talking more about that as we go. Next slide. Rushing the work. Sometimes rushing the work is actually about chunking it down. Um, take those requirements and instead of scanning them, break them up and say, today you're going to do, you know, what step number one or how many steps would you like to work on for this task now? And how many will you do later? So by giving them something they can do now and knowing that it does not have to be um, complete, take some of that pressure off. 
So when you take the pressure off, it makes it a little bit easier. And you want to celebrate the success of that step that your child took, no matter how old they are. Could be a, a, a college student is now home doing online learning. Celebrate what is done rather than focusing on what's not done. And you will find that that creates an environment that's not as stressful and allows for your kids to do more work. Um, and also in, in looking at this, one of the first things that came to mind for me is, wow, maybe an online tutor would be helpful. And I understand for many people, the cost of a tutor right now with everything else going on might be a lot. Um, but there are plenty of students and other young people and retired people, teachers, actually, who are, are now possibly not working um, remotely and have time. Reach out in your communities and certainly let us know if you need some referrals because there are people out there who can tutor your kids just enough to give them a sense of working with someone else. And it's not all about, oh, my mom and my dad or my grandparents, whoever's in the house, are trying to make me do this and they really don't understand my work. So finding someone who gets what they're doing and can really work with them can be helpful. And that person can also help them to chunk it down so they have a better understanding of the responsibilities. Next slide. Same thing here. It really is with no educational supports or hands-on learning. I encourage you to find someone outside of your confines of your home to uh, work with your child. And even if they're a little bit concerned about that and wondering, you know, why do I want to do this or I don't need it, it's not about the fact that they can't do it. It's that this is a substitute for what they would typically get in school and making it a positive. Wouldn't it be nice to talk to someone other than me, your mom or your dad uh, or a sibling? Here's an opportunity to do that once a day twice a week, however you want to work it. But I really encourage for those with looking for more educational support, there are plenty of people out there, coaches as well as specific content tutors who can help with that. Next slide. With scaffolds and expectations, the question I really want you to ask yourself is who sets the expectations? What the answer typically is, is that parents set the expectation for their kids and their teenagers. What I'm going to request of you is that you ask your child to help you with those expectations. So you can ask, what would be some reasonable expectations for you to do every day in terms of the amount of work, times they're getting up, doing chores around the house, exercising, whatever it is. Have them be a partner in the process. It's amazing how different it is when you are asking them to contribute and to work on something for them rather than doing it for them and telling them what they have to do. So really consider shifting that perspective. Next slide. Distractions on home and online, that's a tough one. It's, a, it's probably one of the toughest things that we're all dealing with. How do we stay on track with work, with school, while we're also on a computer that has browsers and other things going on? Um, my best recommendation here is to negotiate the time and to use a lots of timers and check-ins that you and your child agree on. So what I'm talking about here is that when you find a place for them to work, um, rather than worrying about, well, you're going to be too distracted, say, well, let's go ahead and have you work in your room where it's quieter. And would it be reasonable if I came and checked every hour or every 30 minutes or sent a text? You don't have to physically be there if you're sitting at your desk trying to get work done. Um, but having some accountability can help with those distractions and also making sure that when you have a number of kids at home, and they're all trying to do their work, you might need to stagger it so that not everyone is sitting at the kitchen table at the same time. If, you, if they're sharing a computer, 
set up a schedule that works for everyone and once again involve them in that decision making process um, it's not that they're taking over it's that they have um, feedback and ideas and thoughts and feelings that can really help to make the schedule and the plan for less distractibility work well next slide no face-to-face -face accountability we have lots of things that we can do with the understanding that this is also when you have face-to-face -face accountability through um, video. We do video coaching, there's video tutoring, um, using FaceTime, using Zoom, a lot of things out there. And of course, that can be distracting. So you want to make sure that there's someone, whether that is a study buddy, a friend, to say, okay, we're going to do this work together for an hour. And then we get to chat or chat first and get it over with with a timer and then shift um, with all those assignments as it mentioned here about google classroom with any of the online platforms blackboard google classroom other things there's so much going on and so you can be helpful by sitting down with your child and looking at how to chunk down the pieces so the assignments are clearer and then enlist someone else to help them with that distance face-to-face. -face. Next slide. There are a lot of things here, and I know I'm going somewhat quickly, but um, you can always ask questions when we finish this portion. Uh, no time management skills. Yeah, executive functioning skills are definitely going to get in the way as you're going through this, this time at home. So a few suggestions. Timers not necessarily to say we want you to work for a certain amount of time, but to even set, um, set a time and say, see how, how far you've gotten in 30 minutes. Take a look. For younger kids, it's recommended about 20 minutes. 20 minutes, go back and say, wow, I got this much done, or oh, I didn't get anything done because I was actually reading something else, or I was on my phone. So it helps to build in internal time management skills by using different um, external time management features, the timers, the stopwatch, setting that 30 minutes. Some people will do that with a um, recording or a book on an iPod or even just listening to a certain amount of music and then having it when it's over. It's okay, I've worked for 30 minutes of music and then it gets turned off. Um, one other way to do that if you're struggling with helping with those timers, especially if you are in another part of the house and you have to do your work or some people are still going to work in certain parts of the country. Um, another way to do that is, again, using text as a timer, as well as having a timer go off, an alarm go off. Alarms are great. They can set them for once every hour. And then when you can, design a plan at home that will mirror school. So the the schedule. If it's 45 minutes in a class and then a bell goes off, set the, set the alarm for every 45 minutes. Then you get up, move, do it again. Do a little stretching, jumping jacks, yoga, breathing, something to just re-energize the brain in that moment and then make that shift. That can really help students. And ask your kids, what is it that you like about your day when you're in school? What helps you to get through? So that you can then help them recreate that in some form from home. That's calming because again, I said the transition is, is literally we're uprooting people. And when you're uprooted and you have executive functioning issues and trouble transitioning from activity to activity or place to place, um, this is a big brain jumble right now. So anything that we can do to help kids calm down a bit and know that there's some consistency in their day will help a lot with time management too. Next slide. I would say the same thing with the spiraling anxiety and worry. The more you are able to plan and help your students support the plan, including the exercise, the breathing, the breaks, that's going to alleviate some of the anxiety and worry because they're getting something done 
and then they have time to kind of breathe it out. And another piece there is asking questions of, you know, when you've been anxious before for any other reason. What did you do that worked for you? Um, If necessary, there's a lot of um, telemedicine sites and therapists, coaches, and doctors are all doing things um, virtually. So you have an opportunity to connect with someone else if it's really getting worse. Um, But also remembering that when you're, as we're going through this, I should say, because it's not over yet, to have conversations with your children, with your family about how this stress impacts each of you, not in an angry way or an over emotional way, but just to say, this is really hard on all of us. For me, it makes me forget things, for example. You might share that. I know that happened for me. Um, And ask, so how does it impact you? What do you notice? So that your kids get a sense that, okay, this isn't just about me. And as I said at the beginning, it's not just about having ADHD or executive functioning issues. This is about being a human being who is now in that space capsule with family and no one else and nothing else. So talking to one another. The astronauts wouldn't survive up there if they didn't have their daily routines, their exercises, their music, and the others to talk with, even if they're in a bubble or they're wearing a spacesuit. So helping them to make that shift is really, really important. Next slide. Absolute refusal, that challenge number 12, that goes to Similarly, what I was just saying about what's worked before and what are some of the activities, or I, you could call them chores, but it might be projects. What can your, um, your teenagers, your kids do other than play on the computer? Give them a task to do, something that would be interesting to them and helpful to you. Maybe you set up a research project and, and find out what is it that you might be interested in learning more about. Um, and asking them to research it and get you some information. Um, And it's really interesting what comes out of those things because when there's downtime, the opportunity to use their brains, as we know every day, whatever is interesting to young people with ADHD is something that they're going to work on. So finding something fascinating, it might be looking at um, different parts of the world, Uh, trying to get a sense of of biology and mammals and whatever it might be, looking at history. Everyone has something that that they enjoy more than other things. So finding that joy and looking at it as instead of absolute refusal, what are you really fascinated about and would you be willing to do this? And I can tell you that typically after one time um, of doing a little bit of research, they'll continue with that. And if not, maybe say, well, I don't want to do that, but I want to do something else. So now you have two options. Don't give up is is really the message. Next slide, please. Procrastination. Often procrastination is that there's too much to do. And even if there is nothing scheduled, that's where you want to go back to um, the other suggestions of getting a tutor, a coach, chunking down and setting a daily schedule. If there is a schedule and a routine in your home every single day, that is going to help everyone to move forward and it can get, keep the procrastination for over, um, being overwhelmed and putting things off. So if everyone else is doing something, that modeling of this is the time of day when we're all doing work, this is the time of day when we're all doing nothing, Um, that can really help your kids. Next slide. Ah, Stressed executive functions and inconsistent expectations. When I think about expectations, I want to challenge you all to consider that sometimes the expectations that you have for your children, for your teens, and also what they think you have might be very different. And so it's important, it's really valuable to be able to point out that executive functioning skills are to be learned. 
difficult to do them on your own. Let's talk about what it is that works well for you and how we can help take the stress off some of the executive functioning problems by working on your strengths. So when you work on strengths, what do you do well? How can we clarify what the expectations are? Um, Often there is that big assumption with teenagers. Oh, well, my parents expect me to get everything right and get straight A's. Well, where'd that come from? Is that really what your expectations are? And is it really what teachers are expecting right now? My thought would be no. And what you want to do is to be able to clarify and help your kids learn. And even when you have to jump in and help them with certain things, remind them it's not because they can't do it. It's because you're helping them build executive functioning skills so they can do it independently. If you believe in them, you have confidence in them, These are just areas that are not strong yet, which is why a strength-based approach is really, really helpful for everyone in the family, but it helps your kids feel like, okay, you're not telling me I can't do it. You're just stepping in and helping with my executive functioning skills until I build them up to a point where I'm ready to do it on my own. And that's a skill that we use in coaching because often, um, again, we have students who come in and say, wait a minute. My parents are expecting one thing. My teachers want another. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. So kind of leveling it off and and helping them understand the support is valuable is a really good thing. Next slide. The anger and frustration, my hope for all of you, is that as you establish routines and you find some fun and some exercise, something to keep you all healthy, that, and, and find some creative things to do together. Uh, I spoke to someone today who was doing a 1,000-piece puzzle, and she says it's going to take me forever, but it just is, takes my mind off everything else. So finding things that will decrease that, knowing that when it comes to emotional res- regulation and emotional dysregulation, anger and frustration are going to pop up. Life has totally changed. Um, most people that I speak to professionally and personally will say, this is really frustrating. This time makes me angry, this whole situation. So normalizing it, if that's a fair word, just letting your kids know and acknowledging that, yeah, everybody's a little on edge here. Let's see what we can do about it together. Next slide. Zero accountability. Uh, Going back to having accountability through text messages, using timers, finding an external person, it could be a friend, could be an older friend or like a college student who's come home or a professional tutor or coach who can help. There's value in having that someone who is not a family member be in part of that, be a part of that accountability plan. So that helps to take you as a parent out of the mix of the minute to minute day to day and help with the online piece. Um, we meet regularly with coaches and others who are saying, okay, how can I best support students going through this with a zero accountability and looking at how to manage online learning? And that's what we're trying to teach them right now. Even though many of us already do it, we want to make sure we're doing it really well to support everyone through COVID-19 and this shift in accountability. So clarify what's needed, get outside help when you can. Next slide. It's very difficult to deal with that disappointment. Um, When you mentioned the the two seniors and another high schooler, um, everything has changed. And being able to encourage those students whose year is pretty much ended in terms of the activities and the prom and graduation and beach week or whatever it might be, wherever you are, is to think ahead to how you might celebrate when school starts, when they're in college. What are some of the things you can do to prepare yourself so you're so ready that you'll enjoy it more than you might if you were rushed? What can, what can we plan? And you can do some things virtually. There are virtual parties going on, coffees, um, chats, anything. Someone was having a dance party. 
So be creative. And as much as I know, as a parent, that teenager is going to push back, um, maybe check in with some of the other parents and find out, so what do you think maybe we could do? You know, you could throw them a party online and come up with something that might be helpful. And as much as we all uh, understand that extra screen time and video games and such for um, students with and adults with ADHD and executive functioning problems can be really difficult. Right now, we kind of have to juggle that a bit and say, how do we bring some fun into it so that some of that stress and disappointment shifts to, okay, I can't do it now and I can plan on doing something later as well as coming up with something in the meantime, because we need to give them incentives to keep on going during these few months until they're back up, out again. Next slide. Okay, normal incentives aren't working. Um, this is a little more difficult because sometimes normal, normal incentives are different for everyone. And so being able to come up with something different um, is not a surprise because as noted here, being with friends, being able to hang out, going to the gym, whatever it is, is typically external. So finding something at home that will allow for separation so that your teenager has an opportunity to go talk to their friends without you being in the room. That doesn't mean they're going to be doing anything diabolical, but it's about space. When we provide space and trust, that allows everyone to relax a little bit and say, okay, so for the next hour, the bedroom that you share with your brother or sister is now your space, and then we're going to swap. So they have an opportunity to regroup. Many of us don't have that in, in the spaces that we live in um, so that we're kind of on top of each other, but to be able to separate um, switching schedules around can be really helpful. And so the other piece, too, is making sure that there is enough time, not to be afraid of electronics and um, video chatting, because right now that's what's keeping us together around the world, and it makes a big, big difference. So that's where you want to try to build in some incentives with, not for, with your family to make sure that there's something that they would be interested in. And then also look at, if you're giving consequences, what are some of the active consequences you can give? So for example, taking away electronics right now is, is a more passive, I'm just going to take it from you, pull the plug, turn off the internet. What I'm suggesting is you look at things that can be done that would increase physical activity. So what could be done in your yard if it's spring where you are? Um, what could be done in the house? What are some of the, the responsibilities? You don't have to call them chores. Responsibilities that you might give to your kids saying, this is because I trust you and because I know you're growing and you're intelligent and you can do more. So let's work together on building these skills. That might be laundry. In my professional opinion, every teenager should know how to do laundry washer, dryer, setting a timer to make sure they remember to move it around and putting it away. So that can be done as an activity that will take a couple hours while they're doing something else, but it gets them moving around a little bit more. The gardening, the cleaning, as long as it's not you must do this, but you come up with a list, you can really help come up with some unusual incentives for unusual times. Next slide. Um, same thing with this, no social interaction outside of Xbox, being able to help them to know that there are different ways to do it. So let's imagine that, that you're working and during your work time, when it's time for lunch, you and your colleagues end up just chatting while you eat your lunch at your desk. That's a possibility. So while you're doing that, um, you can model a way to take a break and connect with other people. A lot of people, as I mentioned, are doing virtual coffees. Um, they're having happy hours, dance parties. So model what you 
might do for yourself and then share that with your teams. Let them know. For me, this is what works. This is how I get my social interaction. What might you do? What else are you willing to do? And looking at how to help them self-advocate and feel confident reaching out to other people because often that's the problem with, with um, kids with ADHD and executive dysfunction is that they're not comfortable taking that step. So walking them through it, talking them as a parent, coach them through it. What, do you, what might you want to say? What is something you might do? Share online. You could share music, um, videos, whatever it is. And as you work on that with them, I just encourage you to do it for yourself because that modeling makes a big difference. Last slide. Parents' emotions. Well, um, this is listed as challenge 20, and I tell you, it's challenge number one. We want our kids to be happy. We want them to be healthy. We want them to be out in this world that we live in outside of the homes that we've provided for them. And I know it's a crushing blow for each of us. So being able to, as, as this um, parent wrote in, being able to pick your battle and maybe shift the battles to how can we help each other so the battles go away? Like how, let's have a contest. How many days can we go without a battle? How many hours if you're in that stage? But being able to take care of yourself and, again, model it, do daily exercise in front of your kids, with your kids. Um, let them know, hey, I'm going to take a coffee break right now because I need to give my brain time to calm down. And set your timer. Even if you don't need to do that, if you're the kind of person who has that internal clock, oh, 15 minutes is up, I'm going back to do what I was doing. Do it in order to help your family see what you're doing and model that. If possible, with your schedule, take your breaks at the same time they take there so that that can be the time to get together, have a snack, really look at what's going on. And don't forget self-care. I mentioned earlier the fact that there are lots of therapists and doctors out there doing telemedicine. Take advantage of that. It's available at different levels, different prices, really trying to work on what all of us as professionals can do to help families. But when you focus on everything your children are or are not doing, you are not taking care of yourself. And when you don't take care of yourself, you're going to be more frustrated. You're going to be more emotional. And that's going to carry over because our kids pick up. They are so intuitive. They're incredible. But they pick up all the little stuff that we might not notice we're giving up to them. So I just encourage you to take care of yourself while you're being safe. Okay, that was the last challenge. And now I think we're going for um, questions. Yes, lots of challenging questions. Mm -hmm. um, one mom says our team stays isolated in his room doing his online assignments. Should we force him to come out in the open in a more public space so we can monitor him better? Well, I would say that part of it is to make that request of your team. Could we meet on a regular basis just to check in and see how you're doing? Um, not because we don't trust you, but because we just, it's, and don't use the word monitor because that is that, you know, somebody's watching you. So letting them know that, hey, we'd like to check in a few times a day just because we're all here and, and do it in, in a relaxed way. I wouldn't move the entire process because if working in the bedroom or in whatever the, whatever space it might be helps your child to accomplish things, don't break what's working. Um, if there's nothing being accomplished when you check in, and you might do that once a day, twice a day, then that's a reason to say, okay, we're not able to get anything accomplished, let's move it out into the common area. Mm -hmm. Another parent is asking about parent discipline. Um, taking away technology is no longer an option because a lot of the kids are, you know, doing their you know, assignments on it and also interacting with friends. Uh, so how does one 
where does discipline go when you can't take away technology? How do you, is there an alternative, a substitute? Yeah, I, and we talked about it a little bit, that um, using other activities or chores and tasks around the house, um, having your children be involved in something else that they might normally, they might not normally do. So that could be laundry, that could be some cleaning. It's activity to help the family move forward, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a punishment, but it really is an, a requirement as you go forward. So you're getting to connect with your friends. You're on your, um, you're using your technology. And when you're not, here's something that needs to be done every day and having that scheduled. Um, in terms of other consequences, that's, that's a tough one um, because of the situation where technology is typically what you pull away. Um, it could be that you turn it around and make it the positives. What do you get? What else might you earn um, by doing what you need to do? So if you look mm -hmm. at it from the positives, which is, is my preference, then think about what rewards versus consequences. Right. That's a good one. Um, what about online uh, tutoring resources? Uh, are there any organizations, websites that people should go to? A lot of people have taken you up on the tutoring idea. Um, yeah. What would you recommend? Well, I know Khan Academy, K-A-H-N, is out there, um, and I would check with any of the local, in, in your areas, any local tutors who are tutoring companies, um, because most of them had to shift. Um, if someone needs some other recommendations, um, you can certainly reach out to, to us through our website, because some of the coaches will also do that, and they also know tutors, so if we're all here to help you, so if we don't have the service. We're going to get you somebody who does. Um, mm -hmm. So feel free to reach What's out. What's the website? But the one that's, that's out there is Khan, K-A-H-N, Khan Academy. Right, but and, I mean yours. Oh, mine. I'm sorry. Uh, JSTCoaching.com. Yeah. Ah, okay. Feel free to send questions, and we'll, we'll direct you. Okay. Um, a lot of just like uh, – Regular school, when people were going to brick and mortar buildings, a lot of the students and a lot of the parents are having problems with uh, students forgetting to submit work. They're not mm -hmm. hitting the button, so to speak. So I don't, since the parents are right there, is there any any strategy you would recommend uh, to facilitate that? Yeah, it's similar to what we actually do um, when coaching students who forget to turn it in, whether it's online or in person. Mm -hmm is to have a daily check-in with the parents with a list so you know what the list of assignments are, what needs to be turned in, and you're just doing a quick double check. It used to be go check the printer and make sure that the assignment isn't sitting there and needs to be in your book bag. Now it's let's take a look at everything. Once again, this is about helping you with your memory and making sure all that this you're working on gets turned in. You're not being punitive and have a system that is sitting down at the table and going through everything and make sure that each one's done. I would do that daily as just a casual 10, 15 minutes, and that can really help with getting things submitted and also gives a, a relaxed opportunity for your teenagers to share what might not be working for them. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of parents are talking about uh, students, teens, just resisting taking medication now. They feel they're world is upside down, and um, so they've gotten out of the routine of doing that. Um, I don't know if you have any suggestions for that one, but we um, yeah. hope you do. <laughs> yeah, so the first thing that comes up for me is to ask the question, when you were taking your medication, what did, you, what did it do for you? What did you notice you did well or better? Um, and what would it be like for you to continue to do well in that area. Um, and even think about it is you have a home classroom. You are in front of your computer. You're doing your work. What's different about your focus here as compared to when you're in the school? So help them to look at the positives of taking it. Because if it did work before, they're thinking, well, I'm no longer in school. I don't need it. But no, they are in school. They're just in it. They've been transported, so to speak, to a new environment. 
So helping them to notice what works well. And that, that really helps because often you can put in like, well, I noticed this about you, the ability to focus or whatever, and they'll have an aha moment of, oh, so yeah, I did do that better, or I slept better, or whatever it might be. That's a great way to have a conversation. Yeah, that's a good, good advice. Uh, one dad is saying, my 15-year-old son gets really angry when I contact teachers to verify and or follow up on work. Of course, the result is that I almost always catch him lying or making up excuses for not complying. Is there a, a less tension-filled way to go about this? Uh, my recommendation is to ask your student to do it and just show you proof. So if it's an email, um, one thing that's worked really well for me over the years um, is to have the student email the teacher and copy the parent so that there's, there's knowledge of what's happening. Or for me as the coach, sometimes I would get the accountability would be to me. So I get copied to know, great, you followed through and you did that. So that it's not the parent saying, I don't trust you, or I'm just going to do this because you're not getting things done. It's asking them to give you the information and helping to um, teach your kids to self-advocate and to do this more independent from, dependently from you but you're still going to get that same information. And the teachers right. like it too, which the, I think your, your child will find out that the teachers will really appreciate it and probably give that feedback. Mm -hmm. that's, that's great advice. Um, I could see how that would diffuse possible arguments. Um, would you encourage collaboration with student peers and classmates online during this time period? Absolutely. And that's my, uh, certainly my opinion. But the way I look at it is that we're all going through this. And as adults, we know that there are people that we reach out to, we want to be able to do the same thing. So working at home, doing schoolwork, there are so many more group projects these days, hands on work, and working with partners. So being able to do that online is a great idea. Because then it's not just about them against the world or I'm all alone. It's we're working on this together. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really recommend that. Even It doesn't have to be all day long, but finding specific times of the day to say whether it's a subject specific or time of day specific to work together. Yeah. Um, are there any support groups for parents with teens with ADHD going through this right now? I mean... A lot of parents are looking for, um, well, fellow parents to talk with. Yeah, the, um, in terms of specific support groups, I know that um, Elaine Taylor Klaus and Diane Dempster, um, who do the, um, sorry, I'm losing the, the parenting Impact. workshops. They, yeah. Yes, Impact ADHD, they have something right. that's coming up that they're doing it. And the whole idea behind that and what they're doing is they want to connect you all. So that's a place to go. And I have been looking around and I haven't, I see a lot around coaching and coaching support for families, but I haven't seen specific support groups. Um, and again, I do know that there are plenty of people out there who are ready and willing to do this. So I can put it out to all the ADHD coaches out there. I'm, fortunate to you know be able to have my voice heard there and I can I can assure you that there will be people who could set up those support groups even just to facilitate you all getting together on a line because it's a lonely place to be right once again and if there are others I'll share um, go ahead okay how you know would they how would they uh, should they go to your website or? Um, they can go to my website you, and put the request in, definitely. And okay. um, I'm on Facebook. They can just ping me on Facebook and also check, again, with Impact ADHD and find out what's happening with them because they do have programs that are ongoing specifically for parents. Mm -hmm. It's a great resource. And I will promise you, if there are others that pop up, I will share it with with you, Wayne, and attitude so that that can be put out okay. there for parents. Okay. Um, 
Several parents want you to elaborate more on the emotional stress and disappointment that they're, you know, what methods can parents do to handle it? I guess everyone being in one tight space now versus parents at work and, you know, teens at school uh, are, you know, creating some some friction. So I guess they wanted it, if you had any more uh, tips or strategies on that. And Wayne, is it is this um, strategies for parents to stay calm or to help their kids stay yes. calm? Yes, for parents to to try to yes. diffuse some of the emotional stress. Absolutely, um, I'm a firm believer in deep breathing and even 10 minutes. If you can get up before the rest of the family, there's nothing better than just sitting down quietly, whether that's with coffee, tea, or just nothing, and collecting yourself and there are a few steps you can go through one is to moments of gratitude there's always something that we can be grateful for even in the worst of times and so looking at you know what are you grateful for i can tell you the fact that i found coffee beans and i could have my coffee every morning i am very grateful for that because i love coffee (laughs) and on nice days it's the blue sky, but it's something that, and the fact that I have a roof over my head, it, it's really <laughs> about finding those small things. And if you want to take it a little deeper into some mindfulness, one of the practices that I was taught a long time ago, just a simple way is going back to that cup of coffee or tea, hold the cup and just notice the warmth, hold the cup and notice the steam coming out of it, the smell. Whatever it is, the warmth of it as you're drinking it, it it literally takes you down to a level where you're so much calmer that you're able to start the day. And if you can do that throughout the day, also using things like the Calm app um, to do mindful meditation, um, any type of stretching and deep breathing. Once again, I'm saying 10 minutes. You can do it for as long as you want, but even 10 minutes a couple of times a day when you're running around and it's like, oops, I forgot to take care of myself, that's really helpful. Um, Getting together with other parents, definitely if you can't do that within your own communities, um, reach out even to your school system. But um, as I said, we'll we'll see what we can do to to make that happen for many of you um, virtually. So anything that you can do to just have those mindful moments, and I, I encourage you to do that with your whole family. Uh, when you're, if you're able to sit around and have dinner together, to just sit down and say, you know, so what's your favorite thing? Or what are you grateful for? What did you love about your day? So there's no negativity and no conversation about coronavirus, uh, which brings me to the one other suggestion. Try your best not to watch the news. It's a huge difference. If you need tidbits, get tidbits and turn it off or um, check on your phone and then just close the app. It's, um, it's kind of the same old thing every 20, 30 minutes. So once is plenty. Um, and the main thing is to just stay safe and, and be grateful for what you have. Right. I agree with that 100%. <laughs> um, a lot of parents, um, are asking, I know this might be a philosophical question, but they're saying, can you teach motivation to your child? I guess they're, they're, they're all in one space, um, and, you know, the child, even at home, uh, never mind just in the classroom, is not motivated to do the assignment. So, I mean, I mean that's an interesting question, I thought. I'm not sure uh, when we address yeah. that, but can you teach it? confused, don't know the assignment, it's too big for me to manage. And with everything going on now, there's so much overwhelm. So I would say that to motivate your kids around first feeling better, we're doing that breathing, stretching, exercise, something that will help to calm their brain, will open the door a little bit more for you to then 
talk about what the future is in Pakistan because for those children, the future is tomorrow or maybe later today. It's not six months from now. For your kids and older, it's a little bit easier to say this is what's going to allow you to do what you really want to do. So looking at life goals, go back to me, go back to country. What is it that you really want to accomplish and what can you do now to get there? So that's the exciting thing. we need to be watching for. That's where the medication, if it's, if it's prescribed, is really important because that and exercise, um, because that's going to help keep things balanced. Um, and another thing for those who are in with the anxiety and the depression, there's something um, called a happy light. You can get them on Amazon unless they're sold out. It's a Verilux happy light. And it's a tiny little light that sits on your desk and it's full spectrum like some you don't stare into it, and it's not that bright. But um, it changes the tone of the light in the room that's more like outdoor light. And I'm looking right. at mine right now. I have a couple of them. And it just changes things when it's dreary out or if the space that your kids have to work in is not well lit. One of these will help it to be like natural light. So that can help with that too. Mm-hmm. And one last question. I, I think we won't have time for more. Uh, this is a teacher as well as a parent of an ADHD t teen. What one or two things can teachers do at this time to motivate and support our ADHD students? I wondered if you had any thoughts on that. To let them know that doing the best they can is absolutely fine. To, to help them to manage expectations, to be really clear step-by-step step with what they have to do from some of the um, comments that I've been reading um, from parents over the last few days that have come in, and also finding um, a way to connect students with one another in case they're not already connected, encourage them to reach out to peers and remind them that everybody's going through it. I think a lot of it's mm -hmm. support and structure and clear expectations. Right. That's good advice. I think the hour is up, Jody. Um, great advice and strategies. I really do appreciate you stepping up for all the parents who, who wanted help on this. Um, so thank you again. Oh, my pleasure. And again, it's jstcoaching.com. If we can be of any help to you, my heart goes out to families that I, I don't have little ones running around anymore. So um, I'm in a position where I can be here for you. So whatever I can do to help. Oh, great. Well, have Thanks, a good everybody. day. Take and good I, care. And I wanted to thank the attendees for uh, showing up today and participating. And we'll see everybody next week on April 9th when Ari Tuckman talks about healthy habits for the ADHD brain. Thanks, everybody, and have a great, safe day. Bye-bye. Thanks, Wayne.